Oh, yes. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. We are taping here from the cottage today. For those of you watching on YouTube, uh, it's been a gorgeous weekend. We've been puttering around on the pontoon. We even had a barbecue on the boat. So much fun. Uh, we have a special guest with us here today, Sterling Hawkins. We're talking about developing your no matter what mindset. Welcome to the podcast, Sterling. Thank you, Jane. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm so excited to kind of talk through some of these things that uh, no matter what is a really important, I think, topic and mindset for people to be taken. Uh, now, we've been working together for a while now in uh, coaching, and, and I really wanted our listeners to mm. hear your story. So let's start kind of back at the beginning. Tell everybody kind of about the company you built and we'll kind of go on from there. Yeah. Um, well, I, I didn't start out no matter what, you know, I, I started right. out kind of quiet and kind of shy. And admittedly, I got kind of lucky early on in my career. Um, I grew up a fifth generation retailer and okay. right out of college, I started a software company with my dad. And, you know, you can probably guess who my first customer was, right? It was my family <laughs> store. Yeah. And we were doing some pretty cutting edge things. And pretty quickly, we got acquired by a company in Silicon Valley where it becomes part of this like Apple Pay before Apple Pay. Okay. And Jane, it was like I was living a scene out of a movie. Like I go from kind of figuring out my life and starting this business and right out of college where I'm yeah. 21 years old, somewhere in there to living a scene out of Wolf of Wall Street, where we're raising mm. over $550 million, multi-billion dollar valuation and everything that you think goes with it, right? Like flying mm -hmm. private parties at the Four Seasons and the rest I'll leave to everybody's imagination there. Right, right. And I, and I think like, I've got this whole thing figured out, like not only my business, but my life. Like clearly this thing's gonna go public. I and everybody else that's more senior in the company is going to cash in and retire. And, you know, it's just a matter of time until I officially crown myself the next Steve Jobs. Right, right. But. But. but there's a but. It, it did not end up that way. We wouldn't be having this conversation, obviously. Right. Uh, the housing market collapsed. Mm -hmm. And as high as we were riding we couldn't raise any more funding and long, painful, dramatic story short, the entire thing goes bankrupt. All half a billion dollars gone. So when you say that, is there still like a ugh in the gut? Is it still like a punch in the gut talking about it? I mean, you've been talking about it at a lot of speeches. How does it, I mean, how do you reconcile those emotions? You know, it's strange how it has changed because it was a punch in the gut for many years. But now as I'm talking about it, I'm like massively grateful for it. In a wow. way, it's almost like, thank God that didn't work out. That's not the life I actually want to live. That's not the reason that I'm here and mm. I wouldn't wish that kind of downfall on anybody personally or professionally, yeah. but I yes. look at it now and I'm like, that was brutal. And it made me who I am today. And I'm grateful for a lot of tough years in there. Mm. So you're at the lowest end of this. Mm -hmm. Talk about kind of the moment. I think you're living back with your parents, right? You're, you're really only 21 years old at this point. I, I tend to forget that you were that young. Like that's yeah. young to yeah, have been well, flying around in private jets. Like that's young. For, for years, it, it was kind of on the upswing. So when it started to come down, I was probably in my mid to late 20s, somewhere in okay. there. So I had okay. some experience in the world. It was kind of a strange experience, admittedly. 
Um, but it kept me really safe from an emotional standpoint, right? Like there were challenges to deal with, but nothing that felt overly threatening. You know, we had all this money in the bank. We had offices all over the world, 700 people. Like, what did I have to worry about? Mm. And so when the company collapsed, it wasn't just a professional collapse. I personally collapsed as well. And it wasn't just like, oh, I don't have a job. I've got to find a new one. Eventually, I, I run out of cash. Yeah, I go from this big, beautiful penthouse in Silicon Valley, floor to ceiling windows, looking out over the Bay Bridge. I'll never forget it. Mm. To my parents' house, and I, if that's appropriate for some people at different times. For me, in my now probably late twenties, I might have even mm. been thirty when it happened. It just wasn't a good look, and it was. Um, it was the rock bottom of rock bottoms for me. It mm. was kind of like everything that I've tried to do, everything that I've worked towards is is gone. And not only do I no longer have anything, my girlfriend's broken up with me and I'm six figures in debt. Mm. And it was Ow. months of, it was months of just, you know, it being a struggle to get out of bed in the morning sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So your mental health takes a massive <clears throat> kick. Yeah. And so at what point do you start to see a shift? What happens? Um, it, it was almost like there was nowhere further down I could go. I had avoided, denied, and just survived everything I possibly could. Mm-hmm. And it was this thing that my mom said came back to me. I don't know how many weeks I'd been at their house, but she's always got these sayings she has throughout my entire life. And one of them mm-hmm. that came back to me at that time was the way out is through. And I thought, you know, I've, I've literally got nothing else to lose. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure what I have to live for at some degree. It felt like you know, Jane, it felt a little bit like I had my shot and I blew it. Mm. And when that quote came back to me, I said, okay, okay, mom, let's put this thing to the test. If the way out is through, I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through the things that I've been avoiding, the things that I've been denying, the hard truths, the uncomfortable feelings. I'm going to go through all of those things, no matter what. And that's really how it started. It was a personal mantra I used to get myself out of bed in the morning, to call my creditors, to go to the gym. Um, I really didn't care about anything at that point, other than digging myself out of that hole, if that makes sense. Right. I, you know, you mentioned going to the gym and Mm. sometimes getting those endorphins going can be a real game changer for your mindset. And You know, just, and and in fact, I've even heard people say, go outside in your bare feet and stand on the grass. It's literally grounding Mm. and it grounds you to the earth. And then you start to recognize, okay, wait a second. There's life out here. There's life to go on to. So you start to, you start a dig and at what point do you decide that you are going to become a professional speaker? Well, it wasn't really a decision to be a professional speaker, at least in the early days. Mm -hmm. As I was kind of doing some of my personal inventory around what uh, scared me the most, public speaking was actually number one on the list. Oh, interesting. And and I'm kind of the kind of person, like if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Like I'm going to (laughs) jump in the deep end of the pool. And so as I'm having this epiphany of the way out being through, and I'm going to confront these fears that I've had, and at least in some way all my life, uh, my email dings, and it's this conference in Singapore, just sending me junk mail to attend their conference, basically. I have no idea who these people are. I'm sure they send out thousands, if not tens of thousands of these things. And so I hit the reply button and I say, why don't you have me speak? Best Sterling. I, I still have the email. And it, it wasn't, the intention wasn't really to get paid. It wasn't to be a professional speaker. It was, I'm going to go through this fear of speaking in public and I'm going to do it in a big way. Yeah. And, and I don't know, Jane, if it was one of these situations where I had nothing to lose and a lot to gain. Um, but it, it almost felt like a, 
a game where the conference director gets back to me. I end up talking to him. Out of nowhere, I ask him what his budget is and somehow negotiate to be not like a breakout speaker, but the keynote Main. speaker of his event. Main stage, Singapore conference. How many people are at this event? I think it was a couple of thousand at least. It was big. It was bigger than I had ever done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is a guy with a fear of public speaking who just hits the reply button on an email. Like what made him say, yeah, we should. Did he know who you were? Was there some recognition there? Like, well, I wonder what even made him respond to you. Um. It's a good question. And I think, <laughs> I don't think he got many emails like that. So it was probably a little bit of an anomaly, right? Because I, yeah. I didn't give him a bio. I didn't give him a website. I didn't have a speaking reel. I didn't have any of the speaking assets that we all know are, are so important. Mm -hmm. But I think what I shared with him on our first phone call was some of the experience that I had been through. Yeah. And some of the mistakes that I thought we made and some of the opportunities that I saw for everybody, but especially retail, since that was the, the space that I was coming out of. Okay, yeah. And um, we did a little bit of negotiation on the, the phone, and he ends up sending me the contract. And it was only once he sent me the legal agreement that it became real for me, where <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, I'm coming out of this huge failure. I don't know what I'm going to say, and I'm terrified to do it. Wow. But I, I did what I recommend everybody do when confronted with some of those challenges and some of that discomfort, which is I committed in a way where there was no going back before the self-doubt stopped me. And I yeah. signed the agreement and sent it back to him and I was locked in. And uh, did they pay you on that one? Yeah. Yeah. They paid, they, they not so only was... paid me, but they flew me business class over there. I love it. I love that this is right. Your like first very piece. cool. But at the time, you know, we signed it three or four months in advance. I'm as soon as I sign it, I go into panic mode. Yeah. Where like I'm rehearsing like a crazy person. I'm researching. I'm watching YouTube's. I'm practicing. Uh, I joined Toastmasters because I'm like I better like build some yeah. skill set here. Yeah. Um, and as it got really close, it was things like I wasn't sleeping and I was having panic yeah. attacks where it felt like I couldn't breathe. Like it got wow. really scary. It got cool real. It now, did you bring your sister along with you on that one? She's a big part of your business. Did she come with you? I did. So one of the first things I did after I signed the agreement is I, I intuitively knew that I needed some help, specifically somebody to kind of hold me accountable and support me in some of this. Yes. And she was right out of Georgetown University with a marketing degree. And mm. I say, like, obviously, I bottomed out here. Will you help me? Yeah. And like any good younger sibling, she says, Sterling, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> and of course, I'll help you, but I'm coming to Singapore. Yeah. And she was really in it with me day to day. You know, she told me yeah. accountable to get out of bed when I didn't want to, to practice, to, you know, she helped me with the slides and she did come to Singapore and um, she had the forethought to get the recording, to work with the conference organizers and everything else. And, you know, together, that was really the starting point of what's become quite a large keynote speaking business today. Yeah. So you're launched and you're off the mark. And yeah, uh, how many years later are we today? Uh, five or six years, somewhere in there. Five or six years later. So fast forward five or six years. Now, this was actually the reason I wanted to have you on the show was yeah. because recently uh, in April of 2023, I think it was, you landed yourself, I don't know how you land all these events, but you landed yourself in the middle of a big, big run of events. Yeah. De DECA, which is, what does DECA stand for? Uh, well, DECA is a, a business club, mostly for high school, a little bit of college, and it's designed to give high school students and young adults the... Uh, business skill sets that they need to come into the business world. Okay. And so 
deck is like the show of the uh if if this was major league baseball like this is landing at the new york yankees and you are going to be in front of was it 25,000 18 year olds live and another 10,000 streaming in virtually is that right roughly yes it was <laughs> it was massive it was like being at the center of a big football game or something i don't think i've yeah. seen that many people from that perspective ever before yeah and so this is almost like another Singapore moment. I don't really, I hadn't really thought about it this way, but you and I had been working and you worked so hard on your speech. Talk a little bit about coming, leading up to DECA and what that, I mean, well, how was it different from Singapore? Yeah, well, some of the emotions I've become quite familiar with, you know, I've given hundreds of talks over those five or six years. Okay. So like, I know what my body's going to go through. I know some of the thoughts that undoubtedly will surface in my Pop head, up. you know, positive ones, but really more some of the self-doubt, like you can't, you shouldn't, this is stupid. You're going to look bad. You're going to embarrass yourself in front of all these 18 year olds. Um, but I've gotten much smarter in terms of how I approach these things because I know what I'm going to go through. And I think- right. You know, a couple of those aspects that were critical for me is I, I found some some mentorship with you and some others to help guide writing um, what was really only like a 15 minute talk. It was much shorter right. than I typically do. Like a TED talk. Um, yeah. I did a lot of interviews with younger people, some from DECA, some I just did on the side to understand what they're dealing with, the language that they're using, like get inside of what's going on mm. with 18 year olds today, because it's been a while since I've been there. Um, yes. Having those conversations, I realized it's been longer than I even thought. <laughs> and um, I'm the kind of person that practices incessantly borderline obsessively okay. so once i i did the interviews i wrote the talk i reviewed it with you know quote unquote experts to kind of help me and give me some feedback i practiced it i'm not exaggerating thousands of times i mean i was eating sleeping i was even dreaming deca talks yeah. at that point yeah the point yeah. where it's almost like i could forget the memorization of it because i knew it so well it came yeah. from deeper within me in coaching we call that in your bones so mm. and that's what we want we want you to kind of rehearse your stories so that they're just in your bones and when you're able to show up you can just show up kind of authentically there and not in your head you're present totally. you're a hundred percent available to this audience and anything fun that might happen in that moment you're there for it yeah. and but the where you're going next is kind of in your bones so that you don't have to think now what was i supposed to say next and when you only have 15 minutes a ted talk type of situation yeah. you really have to pack a lot into that so um there was some fear i guess of would these people participate with you in this in this way that we were kind of planning out and and we had talked about them saying back to you the no matter what line and would that work and so when you showed me a video of 25,000 people saying no matter what. I mean, it makes me cry right now because this is like an amazing moment in your life, which you didn't know how that was gonna go, right? No, no, I mean, thinking back on it now, like I've done some cool things in my life, but in the scheme of life, this is one of the coolest things I've ever done, full stop. And there were some worries going into it. Like I, I spoke the day before in Phoenix, so I had to take a red eye in. It was oh. a younger audience than I've ever spoken to before. The largest audience I've ever spoken to before. It was new content presented in new ways. So there were a lot of unknowns, yes. um, which is where the, the mentorship, the practice, like all of those things arrived me at a point when I got there. 
I didn't have to worry about those things as much. I was more yes. thinking about stage mechanics and working with the AV team and figuring out uh, the different places on the stage where they wanted me to stand. And, you know, I, I figured I, I had this conversation just with myself prior, like one of these conversations in your head. And I say, you know what, Sterling, I've done everything that I possibly can do. I put in the time, I've invested the money, um, I put in the practice, like I have done everything that I could do. And literally, there was not a minute that I could have spent on this that I, I didn't with yes. balance, right? Like, I, I don't want to spend 24 hours a day working on this. I want, I want to make sure I've got a life and everything else. But I put everything I had into this. And I said, you know what? I'm, this is the best that I can do. What I'm going to deliver on that stage is everything yes. that I've got. And if it's not good enough, it's not good enough. It's, it's all of me. Yeah. And when I, I got to the ending and folks stood up and I could hear them chanting, no matter what with me, it, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. It was one of yeah. the most transcendent goosebump, um, inspirational moments I've ever had, not just on the stage, but ever had period. So I want to just kind of share with our listeners, just so that they can envision maybe that there's going to be a moment like this in their own mm. careers where you're in front of 25,000 people. There's a big difference between even eight or 900 and 25,000. Talk about yeah. how you need to project. How do you need to show up in your body? You know, was there a, a rehearsal ahead of time that, you know, they're really running these things like clockwork. So speak yeah. to some of those things. Yeah, well, I think the key was having it in my bones, right? When I got there, I didn't have to worry about, am I going to remember this thing? Or am I going right. to present that the right way? And having it in my bones meant not just the words, but envisioning myself doing it. What was the body mm. language? Where was I going to be on the stage? And some yeah. of those things got adjusted in working with the AV team. And that was probably the second piece. You know, mm -hmm. when you're in an event that big, there are specific marks on the stage they want you to, to be at. And just to give everybody a picture, there were people in front of me and behind me, which was also a new thing for me. Like yeah. picture 12,000 or so on one side and 12,000 or so behind me. And so working with the AV team, they had two marks on the stage they wanted me to hit. And mm -hmm. what I didn't think about, but they coached me in on because I asked, I think that's key is like, tell me the things that I need to know. Where have yes, other yes. people messed up? Who, where yeah. have other people been really successful, right? Like the AV team can be your best friends on that and, and the uh, yes. project team. Good and call. they said, don't like gaze out at the audience in different places. Look at the cameras in front of you. Okay. Because with that many people, the majority are going to be watching you on all the IMAX. The IMAX, yeah. So if you want them to see you looking at them, you look at the camera. So that that mm. was critical. And that that's not typically the case with, you know, sub a thousand people. Right, right. Okay, so that's really good. Tone, projection, volume. Are you trying to kind of build a little roller coaster? Uh, what are you doing in terms of your voice? You have an amazing voice, by the way. We've oh, talked about you. this before. You're radio ready. <laughs> radio <guess> ready. ready. <laughs> radio <laughs> ready, no matter what. No matter what. Uh, was there anything that you did differently with that? Um, so the audio was really good. You know, if you're in an event with that many people, the AV is is next level. And there must have been 15, 20 people on that team with all the cameras and computers and equipment. I walked into the AV room and it looked like I was walking into NASA. So they yeah. they had the sound really dialed. So yeah. I projected maybe slightly more than usual, but mm -hmm. I was able to work with them in advance to really make sure that the sound was how it needed to be so I could deliver it authentically. I didn't need to stand up in front of people and scream the entire speech so yeah. they could hear me. For I was sure. able to that go up so and good. down in a way that, that was real, you know? That's really important. I'm glad you said that. Was there any feedback 
were you hearing your own words in any way? Sometimes in a stadium setting, that can be really disconcerting. There was, and the, I don't think you can call it ballroom, the, the giant space that we were in uh, mm -hmm. had concrete floors. So not only was I getting a lot of feedback, but there was a lot of like sound reverberations from people talking to each other, going to the restroom or, right? Like okay. you don't have as much, authority or control as you do in a smaller audience where you can see right. everybody right um so it, it was just something I knew that was going to be the case ahead of time yeah and so I could just set that aside and just kind of from a mind and heart space just focus on me focus on the message and the impact that I'm looking to deliver now, now that said, as we got towards the end, you know, some of those more motivational, inspirational moments, I got amped up. I did end up yelling a little bit at the end, but it was, yeah. it was talk appropriate, right? It wasn't like yeah. yelling about some of the down points. It was yelling because there was high energy and everybody's excited and they're chanting yeah. back to me. It, it really, that's cool. you know, looking at it back, I wasn't quite sure how it went when I was on the stage with so many people, but mm. watching it back, I'm like, that was it, it landed even better than I could have imagined. Oh, I can't wait to see it. I hope you'll share it with me. Uh, if course. there's any clips that we want to share, send them over and we'll put them in the show notes so that people can take a look. Uh, and what if they, uh, if people just Googled uh, Sterling Hawkins DECA speech, is will there be anything? Can we get it maybe with a hashtag? Or anything? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe uh, maybe your not. Instagram. Maybe on your yeah. Instagram, there's a clip. Uh, there's definitely clips on my Instagram and all my social okay. and my website is just Sterling Hawkins. So it makes it really easy. Uh, okay. But I'll, I'll give you a clip at least of the very end. So everybody listening can kind of watch what it was right. like at the end of that talk. Uh, it was uh, when you sent it over, I'd been nervous on pins and needles for you for a couple of days ahead of time. And yes, I know one uh, of your mentors is uh, Ryan Estes. And of right. course, we love Ryan over here at the Wealthy Speaker School. And uh, so I knew you had a lot of really good quality advice going into this. Uh, mm. And I'm so, so thrilled for you that it came out beyond beyond your expectations somebody said something to you that made you feel really good about the presentation and know it landed what who was that and what did they say yeah so it, it's wild with that many people i mean they ran their event where there was like a transformer on the stage before me and a dance troupe <laughs> after me like it wasn't your typical like business speaking content right uh, so afterwards, you know, people were taking pictures and talking with all sorts of folks. And somebody came up to me. It was one of the, um, well, if the younger people are young adults, this would have been an older adult, somebody that was there kind of supervising. And he introduces yeah. himself as one of the DECA board members. And mm. he says, Sterling, I want you to know you hit your mark. I've been coming to this thing for 20, 25 years. I've participated in DECA forever. And you hit your mark, unlike any other speakers I've seen on the stage. Well done. And oh. I was like, oh, oh, that oh. Is so like nice. that, that's it. Like that did it for me. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Is there anything that you think you would have done differently? Uh, that's a good question. Is there anything I would have done differently? Maybe, maybe you worried more than you needed to. I don't know. I definitely worried more than I needed to. And, mm -hmm. you know, there, there is something. So I was somewhat concerned around the, the timing they gave me. I was like, oh, well, I need longer. And right. I got there and I was like, thank the Lord that I'm just 15, 16 minutes, whatever <laughs> yeah. it was. Like I maybe yeah. would have gone a little bit shorter um, given the parameters they gave me, because they like they know best. The conference directors, yeah. conference managers, like they know their audience, they know best, and really mm -hmm. like take their advice to heart and say, okay, if they want this amount of time, that's what I need to shoot for, and maybe even a little below that. I actually think that the best speech is under twenty minutes. 
Yeah. And that all, you know, conferences should be running at those levels because if you can't say it in 20 minutes, there's a problem you have, you know, there's yeah. really typically one message that you're giving and this allowed you to introduce the message, yeah. no matter what, to drive home the message, no matter what, and to take it with you no matter what I mean it was it was just right. no matter what all the way down and and uh, I think that that can reassure you that this one message is really all that you need even going forward absolutely yeah and it, yeah. you know it was thanks to your help and some others that I really got dialed in and said okay this is my through line and I don't really need a lot of time to tell that story no. You don't, you don't. And you do tell the, the, the failure story at the beginning and yep. then lead to this. And I think it's just so beautiful. Well, you've come a long way and uh, I'm super excited for you. If people would like to communicate with you, connect with you, what is the best way for them to do that? How do you prefer? Uh, social media is fantastic. You can connect with me there, DM me, uh, my website, sterlinghawkins.com. And that's got all my contact information and be great. happy to hear from anybody. Great. Great. And, um, if I might suggest, I think you're pretty big on Instagram. That's probably a great place to connect with you at totally. Sterling Hawkins, H A W K I N S, uh, right. is the handle out at Instagram. So Thank you so much for your time today. I love, love, love watching this unfold, this whole story. And I'm so grateful for you for sharing it with our audience today. Thank you, Jane. It's been a blast. I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> and with that, we will say, see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now, everyone.